So here I'm talking about how to innovate fast, faster. And I can already see some of you, or imagine some of you, rolling your eyes and saying, oh, here's another innovation salesman with a magic potion. Uh, but I think, or I hope, over the next uh, few minutes, I'll convince you that there actually is a there there, and that the world of software, the world of IT, and the world of computing is really deeply changing in a way that makes it much easier for users of technology, uh, like your industry, to move faster. Uh, to start, let me uh, begin with an, an observation. You know, humans are good at many things, but two of the things that they're really good at is uh, are recognizing patterns in, in, in voices, in images, in data, in, in text, and sharing information and collaborating. And for the first time, really, in technology, it's possible to technically do both of these, at least to some extent. In some areas, actually, computers are getting as good or maybe even better as humans uh, at pattern recognition, uh, at sensing, uh, if you want, even though, on average, uh, uh, there's still a lot of weaknesses. Let me uh, show you a few examples. And these are real-world examples that our customers are doing today on Google Cloud. First, uh, here's our, uh, perhaps our only uh, Google Cloud customer that actually doesn't like cloud. And where they don't like clouds is on their satellite imagery, because their customers want images of the ground, not images of, uh, of clouds. Now, it's actually surprisingly hard to identify the clouds in this picture, because some things are cloud, meaning noise, and some things are uh, uh, snow, the actual uh, information, topographical information. And uh, just to help you a little bit, here is actually the difference. And you can see it's not very easy to tell these apart. And in fact, Airbus has, for over two decades, worked on software systems to automatically recognize uh, the difference. But after two decades of work, their system was only at 87% accuracy. It sounds great, but if you have thousands of images going to tens of thousands, going of hu to hundreds of thousands of images appearing every day, then 87% is not that good. And the human processing, the manual processing you have to do on those images is still a lot of work and a real obstacle to the business. Uh, last year in January, one engineer uh, at, uh, at Airbus using our CloudML uh, beta platform in his very first machine learning uh, uh, project, so he was learning uh, about machine learning as he was doing it, he was able to replicate their existing system in about two to three months, single person. And then with another three months, he had a machine learning-based system that had a four times better accuracy than the existing uh, system. So an error rate of only 4% and accuracy of 96%. One person, six months. It's a real world example. And we didn't help them uh, very much. Here's a very different example. Um, a uh, global NGO who's really trying to combat illegal fishing, they took the tracks, the GPS tracks of boats, and they trained a neural network to figure out, based on the tracks, on the way the ships were moving, how they were doing fishing. Is it long line fishing? Is it trawling? And therefore, likely what they were fishing. And they were able to help the uh, small island uh, nation of, of Kiribati to get a conviction against one of the fishing operations, where the data was so compelling that they could com uh, collect a $2 million fine. So for all of you, that's not that much. But for the island nation of Kiribati, that's 1% of annual GNP. And that was created with an automated analysis that uh, uh, didn't uh, involve humans. 
here's an example closer to home uh, from, from my own world, uh, Google Data Centers. So we have for over 10 years uh, worked at making our data centers more efficient. And in fact, we have made really, really great pro progress on, on average, fleet-wide across all of our sites, including very hot sites like Singapore or South Carolina. The cooling overhead in our data centers is down to 12% versus an industry average of more like 80 to 100%. We're very proud of that. But about uh, 18 months ago, we, tr uh, we, we started thinking, well, what happens if we try and see if machine learning maybe can, can help us improve? And to our amazement, right, certainly to my amazement, we were able to reduce the cooling energy in our data centers during the summer by 40%. Right, over what we had done very, very carefully by hand. And that's really a staggering improvement. And what's happening is not that you know, machine learning can change physics. Right? The physics still is there. But what's happening is that based on a history of one or two years of operation of that data center, the machine learning system really was able to create a hyper-customized control system for just that building that really deeply understood you know, where is the thermal mass in this building and how do you deal with uneven load on the floor, et cetera, and get the set points really exactly right in a way that for humans, there's just too many dials uh, to dial to get it that right. Uh, and then last but not least, um, just two years ago, if you had asked a computer scientist whether the game of Go was accessible to uh, a program, right, was, was, or that a computer could actually play Go. I think everyone would have told you is at least a decade away, the strongest program at that time was you know, maybe at the ambitious amateur level. Right? It was totally not able to, to beat a professional player. And the reason is that Go is a game of intuition and judgment. You can't plan ahead sort of by looking at moves, because the total number of possible moves in this program is so astronomically large that like, it's, it's completely and physically infeasible to build a computer that tries to kind of figure out all the possibilities. But just two years later, a program, AlphaGo, uh, uh, created by Google, by Google's DeepMind uh, subsidiary, was able to beat uh, the top, the undisputed top two players in the world. And in uh, the, the, some of those tournaments uh, lost a single game. Right? So you go within two years from amateur play to beating the best human players, uh, losing just a single game in the process and winning all other ones. Right? How did that happen? Well, it happened with machine learning. It happened with creating a... a a, uh, a neural network that could actually, if you want, form intuition about how good this board position is and what the very few likely moves are that that, that should follow. And so you can subset this huge, huge decision space to just a few moves. And the, the, the network gained that experience, if you want, by just playing millions of games uh, against uh, itself and figuring out what works and, and what doesn't and improving the judgment. So it's really an enormous success and a very exciting time because things that were really not plausible two years ago uh, suddenly seem to work. Now, um, here to talk a little bit more about Google Cloud, and I can't really cover it because it's, uh, it's a very big uh, 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 set of APIs together. But I want to show you how, how our cloud is really built for innovation and it, how it's built differently and how, deep, how deeply we're changing sort of how we think about computing and then how that benefits uh, users like Schlumberger who are on our cloud platform. Uh, let me start with hardware. I talked a lot about machine learning. One of the Achilles heels, if you want, of machine learning is that when you train in neural networks, it is an incredibly uh, a computationally extensive process, even compared to seismic analysis, for example. So you spend literally exaflops of computations, operations, to get a single model to converge. And fortunately, 
these are not exaflops like scientific computation exaflops. It's possible in neural networks to have a much more specialized version of floating point that is much cheaper to do. And so we built, because we had such large problems, we built special hardware that is very, very good at doing exactly those computations. Can't use it for anything else. Right? So it's not a general purpose device, it's a special purpose device. But if we put these together into a system of uh, what we call a, a cloud TPU pod, it's a, it's a four rack uh, system, so relatively small, that four rack system has a computational power of 11 petaflops. Uh, and that would put it in the top 10 supercomputers uh, in the world uh, today. Of course, it's an unfair comparison because it's not really doing scientific computation. You, know, you can't run a weather model in it. You can't run CFD on it. But at the same time, it is a valid comparison because at neural network processing, this machine would be as fast as one of the top 10 uh, supercomputers in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't room for other forms of computation. For example, a very, very large user and also a very, very large seller through our cloud of NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah, think of NVIDIA GPUs as a tool for a broader set of, of jobs. Right? You can use them for scientific computing. You can use them for more general forms uh, of machine learnings. So this isn't uh, a, a, an either or. This is really different sets of tools that apply to different sets of the space. And one of the ways that we're making uh, GPUs even better than they can be on-premise is that in the Google Cloud, when you create a GPU cluster, you can configure the machine that uh, the GPU is attached to. So you can really get a custom scientific uh, cluster. By that, I mean that if for a particular application, let's say you need 20 gigabytes of memory and eight cores and a GPU, then you can configure a virtual machine with 20 gigabytes of memory and eight cores and a GPU. And you pay only for that. And you're not forced, because you need 20 gigabytes of memory, to get to the next la uh, large machine type, which, let's say, has 32 gigabytes. And it comes with 16 cores, which you don't really need, but you have to pay for it. Right? So compared to on-premise, it's a much more flexible uh, environment that actually sc uh, scales much more highly, but saves you money because you'll only pay for the things you'll actually need for your application. Here's another example of hardware that we do very deep in our systems to improve how IT works, and that's security. So every one of our uh, newer servers, and even the network cards, have a chip on it uh, that we call Titan. It's a very small chip compared to the, the, the machine learning one that you just saw. And this chip's purpose is to verify that the identity of the machine and to verify that the software that's running on it has not been tampered with. So if someone hypothetically tried to modify the BIOS or any firmware in our systems, this system will no longer boot because this chip actually sits between the CPU and the configuration space and validates using cryptographic signatures every single time the machine boots that the software on it is the software that we want to be on that machine. And so that now means we can trust all the security systems that are built on top of it, because we can prove that those binaries were built from the software that we actually wrote, and they haven't been tampered with. And that's, again, something that you can get only on, on Google Cloud, because only we go to these kinds of extremes to make a security work. Here's a last example of, of really a hardware thing that differentiates us. We have, for a very long time, operated very large services. So Google today has seven products with more than a billion users. Uh, and that, uh, of course, these users are worldwide. And in fact, today, it has an eighth product with a billion users. And as is, that is Google Cloud. Uh, these are not Google users. These are the users of our customers. But so every single day, the customers of our customers, um, there's over a billion different IP addresses that connect to the Google Cloud to access some functionality. So this is computation at scale, which needs a network at scale. So we operate uh, what is very likely the world's largest uh, uh, network, global network. Uh, external estimates uh, uh, put it at carrying 25 to 
of the world's user-facing internet uh, traffic. Uh, to do that, we had to build our own a network over a long time. So this consists of a lot of fiber uh, in all kinds of places. Uh, right now, eight different submarine uh, cables that we actually uh, helped build and co-own, because that's the only way to get that uh, kind of ca uh, capacity and really be able to serve the world in, in pretty much any location at very high performance and very high uh, security. Now, um, if you use Google Cloud, you can use this network. But because we believe in flexibility and paying only for what you need, you actually have a choice of which network to use. So our premium network is a network I just showed you. This is the same network that Google itself uses for all of its applications. So if you need that for your application, you can pick that. But if you have an application that doesn't quite need the top performance, because maybe you're doing bulk transfer of data or, or sort of something like that, you could choose a more uh, conventional looking network, a network that's more like what you would get from, from uh, 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 a public uh, internet uh, service or, or the other public clouds. You'll pay less. You get less performance because we hand it out to the public internet much faster. You maybe get a little bit less security. But for the right application, this may make perfect sense. And so we let you uh, choose. Uh, in fact, to just reinforce that once more, Google is probably, or the Google Cloud is probably the most pure play cloud infrastructure where you pay only for what you need. I already told you about the custom machine types. It's very important for scientific computing. But we also have per minute billing. So when you get one of these VMs and you stop using them, then literally that minute you stop paying for it. The network you saw, uh, you can pick which network so you don't pay for the quality you don't need. And last but not least, we actually have automated, automatic discounts. So if your workload is relatively flat, which makes it cheaper for us to implement because we don't need to keep around reserve capacity, you automatically get discounts for your per minute rate uh, without needing a commitment. So it's very much pay as you go. Um, one question I get a lot is, OK, if, if cloud is so great, uh, you know, how quickly should I move to it, and, and how do I move to it? And you know, should I be hybrid, or should I be all in? And our answer is uh, two ways. Uh, one is, yes, you should, because the advantages of, of a cloud like the Google Cloud Platform, they're becoming so big relative to what's possible on-premise that for certain, at least for certain parts of your IT, it's an incredibly compelling case. Because, not because you will do the same thing 10% cheaper, but, but because you get capabilities that you really cannot get. And therefore, you can extract business value that you just can't get today. But in many industries, including yours, it actually makes sense to be hybrid. Because, for example, in the exploration uh, uh, space, of course, there is certain computation that needs to be very close to the field. You can't just go move it to a cloud that's, that's far away, even if you have a great network. So we, th we believe that hybrid is, is normal. Right? It's going to be a standard state of operating for many people for the next decade, and for some of them, for really forever, because right? it's the right choice. Now, hybrid sounds great, but it's actually difficult to do in practice, because if you are on the public cloud, and if you are on your private cloud, now you have two stacks. Right? You have two ways to train your people. Maybe you have two ways to administer these things. Uh, two ways to think about security uh, is actually a large tax for people to pay. Now, fortunately, we have an answer to that. And that answer is an open source answer. So it's driven by Google but it's not owned by Google. And it's called Kubernetes. Uh, I won't go into it too much in too much detail, but Kubernetes is about uh, container management. And containers are things that you can put your services and your applications into for deploying. And then Kubernetes lets you manage those deployments and manage those services. And it's supported on virtually every environment in the world. So every public cloud supports Kubernetes. Every on-premise uh, environment supports Kubernetes. VMware, uh, Windows, Linux, uh, Red Hat, 
even, even IBM mainframes uh, uh, started su as supporting Kubernetes uh, today. Kubernetes as a project, as an open source project, is only three years old. It's based on over 10 years of experience of how we did things at Google. We've been using containers since 2007 uh, inside, uh, you know, in our internal uh, Google Cloud. We, have, we didn't use VMs. So there's a lot of experience in it. And because it is a, a, a really great fit for many cases, it's just been exploding in popularity. It's had 15,000 contributors uh, just in the last uh, uh, two years uh, who added to the, the software. Uh, it, as I said, it supported virtually everywhere. It's one of the most popular open source projects in the world. And so with Kubernetes, you can adopt a cloud-like way of structuring your services. And you can adopt that today on premise, but you are not forced to get those benefits. You are not forced to change everything. You're not forced to move to the Google Cloud or to any cloud. You have that choice still, and you can change that choice over time because Kubernetes gives you that portability across clouds. So that definitely would be my first uh, uh, advice to you if you think about moving to the cloud, have a very, very close uh, look to Kubernetes because it's probably your best move because it doesn't bundle everything into one move and it gets you to a better place, even on premise, and you haven't excluded any other possibilities. And of course, Google Cloud Platform works great with Kubernetes uh, and, and automates its operation even further compared to what you have on cloud. Now, why am I talking about all, all of this? Um, just like uh, we heard before, I'm talking about it because velocity really matters. And I'll give you this example. 30 years ago, um, 40 years ago, let's say 1980s, the best technology that you could buy pretty much, much across everything was in the enterprise. Right? The best phone, the best computers, the best cameras, the best everything was in enterprises. Right? Today, that is totally not true. Right? The best technology is in the hands of consumers who are paying far less for it than you do. Right? So why do they have better cameras? Why, why are they using machine learning? Why have they been using cloud for 15 years? Right? The answer is because the software velocity in the consumer space, because it is cloud-based, is much higher. In the IT enterprise, change is scary because change breaks things, because everyone is a snowflake. Nobody is like anyone else. You might all use the same kind of components, but you put them together in different ways. You have different versions. And so as a result, introducing a change is a risky endeavor. It creates outages. That's why you do it more slowly. And after decades of that versus the consumer innovation, where you know, on my Android phone, every user of the Gmail app, or virtually every user of the Gmail app, is on the same version of Gmail. And their Gmail updates overnight, and they don't even notice, and it always works. Right? If you have that freedom in the software to really innovate and to move, then you're just ending up in a much further place. Right? And so my main, mes main message to you today is that in enterprise software, we have fallen behind, and really fallen behind massively behind consumers. And the reason is that everything is too high friction. And systems like Kubernetes and the Google Cloud reduce that friction. And they are, in fact, the systems that people are using who write consumer software, you know, like Google for Gmail, right? Or like Apple for all kinds of things, or like Facebook, right? They are using Kubernetes, and they are using platforms. Uh, like the Google Cloud Platform. So this is the number one way to get back on a faster velocity, and that's really by changing the way, uh, changing how you think about IT. Now, before I go to the next step, I've talked all about software so far and how to make software development better and deployment and, and, and things like that. Let's not forget the people. One of the things that actually deeply influences how well people collaborate is the tools that they are using. And at this point, let me pitch, uh, ma make a pitch for G Suite. G Suite is not a document suite. It's a collaboration suite. Two-thirds of US students are using G Suite in a day-to-day -day 
uh, uh, schoolwork because it's so easy to use and because it's so collaborative. And these are your future employees, and they expect much more than what they have today in the enterprise about sharing. And just to make that concrete, I'll give you one little snippet from my own world in operations that has nothing to do with document management, but actually very deeply has to do with speed of moving. And what that, what that example is that Google Docs lets you have a document that multiple people can, op uh, can operate on and can edit at the same time. And, you know, sounds kind of cool, but you know, it's more like a fad than useful. Well, at Google, when we have an outage, we want a postmortem, right? So if there's something happening, well, we create a postmortem and it analyzes, it describes what happens, analyzes the root cause, here's the action items to follow up, et cetera. At Google, the postmortem usually is finished within an hour or so of the actual event. Because when the event starts, we create a new document from a template. We make that document writable by everyone. And then as the outage happens, as people actually figure out things, they paste their findings into this document. And everyone who has that document open sees that change within a second. And people can add comments. They can assign tasks. They can correct each other's things. And this stuff isn't happening in a million different phone conversations and separate email threads. And, 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 and you know, networking people still are thinking about that, whereas the applications people have already figured out that it's something else. No, it all happens in the same document in real time. It's not an IT system. It's just a document. It's super easy to use. People across different continents different groups. Right? It's really a common language, so it's a very, very deep impact on how people, how quickly people can come together, especially uh, when there's a problem. So collaboration and the frictionless collaboration is really something that matters for people too, not for software systems. Now, how do we actually increase velocity, not just for individual companies or developers, but for an industry? The simple answer uh, uh, for today's talk, for your industry, is actually to work with Schlumberger. And I say that not just uh, because we're here at the Schlumberger uh, uh, conference, because, but because it's actually true. We've been very privileged to work with Schlumberger on creating a new platform. This platform is going to be is based in the cloud, and therefore it has this, uh, this, this consumer-grade velocity, this consumer-grade update cycle. It can be delivered as a service. So it's no hassle to you to deal with those upgrades. And it will give you a digital, a consistent view uh, digitally of everything that you have. Uh, just to go a little bit into that, I don't really have time to go, and, and I think Ashok Bilani will, will talk to you a lot more in detail what it is. This is not a small project. Right? This is no easy feat. And I would actually say that just two or three years ago, um, it would have been a, a, a challenging proposition to do something like that. But the capabilities of clouds have improved so much that today it is actually feasible. Uh, and I hope that five years from now it's going to be easy right? because we get better and better at building systems like that. So I'm, I'm very excited about this platform. I'm honored that we're, we're, we're part of it. And I think it will change the way you all perceive uh, software as, as a service. Now, we don't operate in a vacuum. And actually, it's not just us in Schlumberger. So we have the benefit of a great uh, ecosystem of partners that uh, make it much easier to build a really, really compelling uh, experience. So, so let's, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to give them a shout out uh, as well. So it's really a community effort. And in the cloud, it's much easier for such a community to come together. So to recap, I really want to leave you with sort of three high-level thoughts. Um, first of all, that you actually, we all as enterprises, we have to get to the consumer-like speed of innovation. Right? The fact that in consumer products this works means it's not a dream. Right? It's possible. It's being done today. Right? And we are falling further and further behind. And one of my main theses is, is that this is because the software environment that we live in is not competitive with the software environment that consumers and people who build consumer uh, software live in. 
So the cloud really is the answer for this, especially when the cloud, uh, when you can partner in the cloud with deep domain uh, experts like 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 Ashok and uh, Ashok and his team. Second, um, when you think about going to the cloud, and you definitely should do that. Ask Google. We believe that you should control the pace of your movement into the cloud, and Kubernetes and containers gives you a way to control that. Gives you a way to modernize what you have while you move some parts of it, but without really tying your hands into a single ecosystem. So leaving you lots and lots of choices. And last but not least, both across the technical space, software development, engineering, scientific simulations, and simulations, and the, and the human space, so people collaborating with, it, with, with each other, people talking to each other, sharing documents, removing frictions, Removing friction is really the key to making things go faster, right? And we don't think about that enough. And those, the ways to, re, uh, you know, uh, instruments that can remove friction have a very long-lasting impact on your company. Thank you very much.